Well, I'm, I'm Gene Cernan. I guess uh, to identify myself, an Apollo astronaut, commander of Apollo 17, flew three times, last man to have walked on the moon. Now that we got that out of the way, uh, I'm living my second childhood these days because aerospace and aviation has been my life all my life. I'm just lucky enough as a kid I had a dream about flying airplanes off of aircraft carriers and lo and behold that dream took me to the moon. And uh, here I am I guess you might say in my senior years and uh, I'm still flying which is most important to me. I've got my own airplane, a, a Cessna 421 and I'm doing a lot of work uh, representing and working with Bombardier and uh, flying uh, flying everything from the from the Lear 40 up through the Global Express card carrying captain on the 40 and 45 and and I only tell you this because this is my life and I enjoy it and when when someone takes my airplane away from me I'm going to be I'm going to be tough to live with Well, not so much testing, but when a, when a new airplane comes off the line, I do get an opportunity to fly it and uh, doing more in the uh, international marketing side of the business and uh, working primarily with their demo team. Uh, as a, for instance, uh, when the Challenger 300 came out and pre-certification about two years, three years ago, I guess it is now, we flew it. I was part of the crew and flew it from, uh, from the States all the way to the Singapore Air Show and back, and, and that was an exciting trip on on really a, a, a special and unique airplane. And in your, and you say you've your own aircraft, so in your spare time, you, what do you find in your spare time? Well, I, I, uh, I don't have much spare time, oh, okay. so I try and fly my airplane whenever I can, a little bit on business, and I have got a, a, a small ranch in Texas, uh, west of San Antonio, and it's about four hours by car and one hour by airplane, and so I load up my Labradors in my airplane and off I go. So I, I, I enjoy flying. I've done all kinds of flying. I'm a Navy carrier pilot, so uh, anything I get my hands on is... Uh, is, is well, I'd love to, and I know I'm going to get an opportunity. I did something else. Uh, I've soloed a balloon, I've soloed a glider, and just about three weeks ago, I I went up in one of those, jumped off a mountain in one of those parasails. You know, you call it a, you call it a flying bed spread or something, and that was exciting. I'd like to do that again too. It's it's just amazing some of the things there are to, are to do yet. Well, help out. I think it's important, you know, while there's several of us who have been there, who, who, have, who have successfully been there and come back, but also made a lot of mistakes along the way, both in the design of the spacecraft and the development of operations, are still here today. And what NASA has wisely done is called upon us to give them some of our impressions and talk to some of these young engineers. You know, the world of technology, the technology of Apollo, has long since been forgotten and obsolete. But we represent some of that technology, and in some cases, going back to the moon is not going to be a lot different than what we did 30 and 40 years ago. So so uh, we've been asked to come back and give our opinions. Some of them are good opinions, some are bad. Uh, but uh, And then some of these young, really smart engineers with this new technology can build on, on what we did and hopefully not do some of the dumb things that we did. And we did make a few mistakes along the way. Uh, well, we were the first one to take the lunar module to the moon, Apollo 10, and uh, we did take we did everything on that mission but land. I I like to tell my friend Neil Armstrong that I I painted that white line in the sky to the moon so he wouldn't get lost, and I let him go the last 47,000 feet. But that that was a truly a lunar a, a test of the lunar module because if we had found some problems, Apollo 11 probably would not have landed. It would have slipped another flight. And these smart young engineers, have they told you what sort of technologies they want to use on the new lunar lander? Well, they've got some ideas. Uh, quite actually, some are very good because they can apply some of the new tech. Now, you know, new technology. You've got a, in, the, in the palm of your hand with one of these Blackberries. You got more technology than I had to go to the moon. It, it's crazy. Cra it's crazy. But they can employ that technology on the design of the spacecraft themselves and on the operational techniques that we want to use. Now, I will say this: some of them have got some crazy, in, in fact, dumb ideas. 
because we've been there, done that kind of thing, and it doesn't work, no matter what kind of technology you got. So that's what we're trying to do is prevent reinventing a wheel. You know, it's been four decades. Some of these young engineers weren't even born when I made the final steps on the moon, and they all got good ideas, but, but you have to temper the enthusiasm of youth with the wisdom of maturity. Well, I, w I, was, I was one switch away from being cut loose uh, from flying, you know, this goes way back, from flying around in space uh, on a 120 or 30 foot tether. We didn't, uh, we had little or no experience. I was the third, third human being, second American to walk in space. We had a, probably a grand total of 20 or 30 minutes in space prior to, and walking in space prior to that. And I was going to be out there for two and a half hours flying around the world on this, on, on this maneuvering unit. Uh, we overlooked, that's one of the kind of mistakes we made. We overlooked the, Im the impact and the influence of the laws of Mr. Newton. For every action, there is equal opposite reaction. And I looked at Gemini 9 at that time. I was just disappointed my first flight as being a failure, but in retrospect, looking back, we learned so much about what we didn't know that the next several flights proved out some of my problems, and then we were able to successfully overcome them. Had you been able to train on, on, on the astronaut maneuvering unit in some sort of Earth-based analog situation? Well, we trained, I trained, I trained with what we had in a way of simulators at that time, and they were pretty crude, and and then it, with a real backpack and a, and a three or four, three degree of freedom machine about half the size of this building but there was really no way and and I did a little training on a zero G airplane but that was only 25 seconds and that was just getting in and out of the spacecraft and strapping on this unit but uh, it, that was one of the problems our training was was in small increments that when we got out there in the real world and had to expand the influence of zero gravity over a long period of time that's that's when it got to me Maybe the International Space Station is a fantastic opportunity. Maybe the International Space Station is a fantastic opportunity or location to train for moon missions and do the sort of things you're going to do on moon missions in low Earth orbit, maybe. You mean use the space station to do some of that training? I, I don't think so. You know, there's a lot of training. As a result of my Gemini 9 mission, uh, we do a lot of training underwater. And that's neutral buoyancy. That's not zero gravity, but it does help. It gives people an idea. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not a big fan of the space station, but it's it's the only asset we got in town. It is an international venture, and I think in the next several years, when the rest of the international community comes uh, comes together on the space station, it's going to eventually produce some some significant results. But you know. I, I've been waiting to go back to the moon for 35 years. Uh, you know, not just not me personally, but us in general. And uh, my glass has been half empty. But now, since uh, since President Bush has uh, indicated we've got a program, we're cutting the hardware, we've got some plans to go back to the moon and and on to Mars. And that's going to be an international project. I don't think there's any question about. It. My glass is no longer half empty; it's half full. Now, will I live long enough to see us go back to the moon? It's going to be touch and go, because I think it's going to be 12, 15 years. I'm 73. I'd like to live longer. Am I going to live to see us go to the Mars? No, but you will. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's brilliant, Dr. Cernan, yeah.